Hello students, Sean McMahon here. So in the last video of the series, uh, and really the first, we did an introduction to molecular formulas and the different types, right? So we, we talked about formulas for elements, uh, both in atomic and molecular form. We talked about an elements being one type of atom. We talked about compounds, both ionic and covalent. This video is gonna be shorter because it's very, it's now becoming more specific instead of broad and general. So the focus on this video is binary ionic, okay? So ionic like table salt. So as a review, and I'm gonna go through this quick because we had this in the last video, we had sodium, which is a metal, chlorine, which is a non-metal, combining to produce salt. So what do I have? I have an, a metal and a non-metal combining in a fixed ratio. So they're making a compound because a compound is two or more types of elements combining in a fixed ratio. And the two elements are a metal and a non-metal. So that's gonna be ionic, why? Metals like to lose electrons to form an octet Non-metals gain electrons to form an octet. Why is this video called binary ionic? Well, binary, right? When you think of a binary language, don't you think of ones and zeros? There's only two. Binary means two. So in sodium chloride, there's only two elements. And it happens to be a metal and a non-metal. So it's ionic and it's binary. Oh yeah, the twos, we gotta balance it, but that's a whole other section. This is focusing on naming. So we've already talked about predicting charges, right? We're gonna use our periodic table. If you don't have one out, take it out. And the metals, which are on the left side of the staircase, right? They're gonna form the cations because they have fewer valence electrons and it's easy to lose them. The non-metals, which are to the right of the staircase, are closer to the noble gases, so they need to gain fewer electrons and it's easier to gain a few than lose a bunch. So when they gain electrons, they're negatively charged. If you still don't understand this, you have to either read your textbook or review those videos again. So a lot of people are like, well, which ones do I need to know? Well, you use a periodic table and we use these blocks. This is the S block. This is my P block. It's also referred to as representative elements. So lithium, right? The lithium ion forms a plus one charge. Why? It's in group 1A. All group 1A elements form a plus one. So we're using our periodic table. And then we go down to beryllium, right? What does it form? The beryllium ion has a two plus. Why? Well, that's easy. It's in group 2A. 2A forms a Two plus. Now, conventionally, you don't write plus two. I'm actually doing this wrong. It would be a two plus. Okay, that's how you do it conventionally. Then I go down here, aluminum, right? What charge? Three, because it's easy to get rid of those three valence electrons. That's why it's placed in that family of 3A or group 3A, that column because it has three valence electrons. And it's easier to lose the three valence electrons than to try to gain five to be like argon. But what's a little bit different is now we start seeing these asterisks. Like, what does that mean? So the charge of these metals, right? You can't use the group numbers. Why is that? Well, they're not in the representative elements. They're in this little valley we call the transition metals. Now, the majority of transition metals can form more than one charge. That's why people don't like them, okay? The ones that we have here only form one charge. So which one? Scandium. So you can look at scandium in period four and think, all right, it could try to gain so many electrons to be like krypton, or it could just lose it's got 21 electrons. If it loses three, it'll be like argon. So it's easier to lose three than to gain, what is that, 15 
to be like krypton. So it loses three electrons. So if I lose three negativities, I become three positive. So scandium is always a plus three. Silver and zinc are a little tricky. We haven't talked about principal energy levels yet. So I'm going to just try to use a little trick to help you remember that. And again, if, if it doesn't help you, don't use it. Do you, but you need to know these. <laughs> okay. So the way I remember is aluminum is in group three. So it forms a three plus charge. Well, if I look, I'm walking up the stairs, folks. This is stair number one, stair number two, and stair number three. So silver has a plus one charge, zinc, which is on that second little stir, has a two plus, and aluminum has a three plus charge. Now, when we talk about quantum mechanics, electron configurations, we'll make more sense of it. But for now, the staircase makes it nice and friendly. But our focus is not transition metals right now, okay? We're doing type one, where their charge is the same. So again, you do need to know, you know, zinc is two plus always, and silver is plus one, and scandium is three plus, just like in that table. But we're really going to be mostly talking about the representative elements and the ions they form. So some examples of binary ionic. So why is this binary ionic? Binary, two elements. Ionic. They have to have ions. Well, you have to have positive cations and negative anions to form an ionic compound. So what do I need? I need to form ionic compounds, a metal, right? And a non-metal. That's the easy way to think of it. Rather, I should say I don't need those, but if I have those, it's ionic. We'll see later. I don't quite need those. But if I have a metal and a non-metal, I'm ionic. So I look on the periodic table. Sodium, metal. Chlorine, non-metal, when they come together, sodium chloride. Magnesium, metal, bromine, non-metal, come together, binary ionic compound, magnesium bromide. Potassium, right? Metal, how do I know? Left of the staircase, group one. Sulfide, or sulfur rather, non-metal, group 6A, right to the staircase. So I have a metal and a non-metal, this is an ionic compound, potassium sulfide. Notice that all the nonmetals end in ide. So it's not sodium chlorine. They cut off that end, keep the root of chlor, and add an ide suffix. Same with bromine, right? They cut off the end and put an ide. Same with sulfur. Why is that? Well, to name binary ionic compounds, you write the full name of the metal cation and then for the non-metal anion and again cations are positive like a pa anions are negative you take the root of the non-metal and add the ide suffix so that's that's it but it can get challenging right so to get a formula from a name is harder i think so here if you see the formula, you'd be like, oh, that's easy, sodium chloride. You see this formula, that's magnesium and that's bromine, magnesium bromide, potassium sulfide. So going from a formula to a name with ionic compounds is cake. You just read it. It's a lot harder, right, going from the name to the formula. So we have to make sure when we're doing that, to first figure out if it's binary ionic. If you know it's ionic, then you need to think about the charges because that's how you're gonna get a neutral compound and that ratio you need. So you have to look at charges to determine the correct subscripts. So I'm gonna show you this. If I told you aluminum oxide, right? The really cocky student's going to be like, oh, that's easy, dude. It's A-L-O. And they're only half right. They have the right symbols, 
but they don't have the correct ratios. They don't have the right subscripts. So how do you get the right subscripts? You have to first recognize that this is binary ionic. How come? It's binary because aluminum and oxygen, two, it's two elements. It's ionic because aluminum is a metal and oxygen is a non-metal. And how do I know that? I'm looking at the periodic table, the staircase. So as soon as I see that it's a metal and a non-metal, I know it is ionic. And as soon as it's ionic, I need to think of charges. As soon as I know it's ionic, boom, charges. And metals form positive charges and non-metals form negative charges. So metals form cations and non-metals anions. So I look at aluminum and I see aluminum's in group 3A. So it has a three plus charge because it loses its three valence electrons. I look at oxygen. Now it's in 6A, but it's not gonna lose six valence electrons because it's easier to gain two to be like neon. So it has a two negative charge. So how do I get the right ratio? Crisscross, applesauce. Now, if you don't like crisscross, it means you're not comfortable with simple math. <laughs> and you're gonna have to review that. But you can think of it as, what is the common, right? The least common multiple of three and two. It's six, right? So what ratio, are they, what do they both go into? They go into six. So if I have two aluminum three pluses, the aluminum, the two of them are contributing to a six plus charge. Just like if I have three oxygens or oxides, the three of these are contributing to a six minus, right? And six, Minus six gives me a neutral compound, which is this ionic compound. So I have to use the number of the cations as a subscript and the number of anions as a subscript. But you don't want to have to write it out like that. Just write out the charge, which you have to think of because it's ionic and there's ions and crisscross applesauce. So let's do a little practice. Sodium nitride, can we make this a formula? So what's the cocky student gonna do? The cocky student's gonna be like, dude, this is so easy. Sodium nitride, man. You're half right. You have the right elemental symbols, but the wrong ratios, why? If it's a metal and a non-metal, it's ionic. If it's ionic, there's charges. The charges have to cancel out to form a neutral compound. So I have to look on the periodic table and be like, oh, sodium has a plus one charge because it's in group one. Nitride, it has a three minus charge. So what am I gonna do? This number three is gonna be the subscript for sodium. This is a one, you don't have to write a one ever, right? You don't have to do that but that's gonna tell you what that ratio is. So sodium nitride is this. Now going from formula to name is cake, cause you don't have to say, you just say calcium chloride. But again, potassium sulfide. What's a cocky student gonna do? They're gonna ah, do cake. What did they not do? They didn't identify that this is an ionic compound. How do I know it's ionic? Metal and a non-metal. Metals form positive charge. I look at group one, potassium's plus one, sulfide's a two negative. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna do what I've been doing, crisscrossing, and I get potassium sulfide, two potassiums to cancel out the two negative charge. And then D is a cakewalk, magnesium oxide. Now, why is this a one-to-one -one ratio? Well, let's look at it. Magnesium is a two plus. Oxygen's a two minus. So the simplest ratio, what you don't wanna do is this, because for ionic compounds, you want the simplest ratio. And two would go into both of those. So you can just think this is a one-to-one -one ratio and it'll be neutral. 
So that's why you have that, right? Why is calcium chloride CaCl2? Well, calcium is a two plus, chloride's a minus one. When you criss cross, you need two cal chloride ions that are negative one. Well, I hope that helps. That is your binary ionic, the one type for uh, instructions on how to name them. So in the next video, we'll get binary ionic as well, but we're gonna deal with transition metals. That's a little tricky. That's where that valley is. You can't use the group numbers to figure out the charges, but there are tricks. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for tuning in and I'll see you on the next one.